Flat Earth Falsities, Plain Nonsense Flat Earthers have lots of questions about how airplanes can work on a spinning, spherical Earth that they seem to think cannot be answered. Well, of course, these questions are based on misconceptions and are easy to answer when you understand some simple scientific principles and the physical forces involved. Here are just a few of the most common questions. Number one, why does it take the same time to fly east as it does west if the Earth is spinning at 1,000 miles per hour? Well, there are two reasons that this is not a problem at all. Firstly, airplanes fly through air. They require air to generate thrust with propellers or jets to move forward and to generate lift to stay aloft. And all the atmosphere of the Earth rotates with the Earth due to gravity and friction. Earth's atmosphere is held to the Earth by gravity. This is evidenced by many things, but most notably by the fact that the higher you go, the weaker the atmospheric pressure is. Atmospheric pressure is just the weight of the air above pushing down on the air below. If the air was just contained in a dome or firmament, as many flat earthers claim, rather than being held by gravity, then there would be no reason for air pressure to decrease with altitude. And that pressure causes friction against the surface of the Earth, and also air molecules have friction against each other. If you don't believe that, hold your arm out of the window of a fast-moving vehicle. The force you feel is the result of air friction. The laws of physics cause the atmosphere to rotate with the Earth. It would actually take some unknown force to counteract the friction to prevent the atmosphere from revolving with the Earth. So a plane flying east has to fly through about the same amount of air as a plane flying west, plus or minus wind currents, regardless of the Earth's rotation. Another fact that flat earthers are ignoring, or are ignorant of, is the law of conservation of momentum. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion. So a plane sitting on the ground is already moving with the Earth. It does not instantly lose that momentum when it takes off. It continues moving with the Earth and must use thrust to add or to subtract from that movement. This is really simple to test. Just toss up an object while you're in a constantly moving vehicle. Does it slam into the back of the vehicle? No. It keeps moving with the vehicle and with you, and from your frame of reference comes straight back down. That is conservation of momentum. And the same goes for aircraft taking off. They keep their momentum moving with the Earth and fly through the air that is also moving with the Earth. Number two. How can a plane land going north or south if the Earth is spinning sideways at 1,000 miles per hour? The answer to this is the same as for the first question. The airplane, the air, and the Earth are all moving east together. So this poses no problem for landing north or south. A strong crosswind does make landing very difficult, but the Earth's rotation does not cause crosswind. Wind is generally caused by temperature gradients. Hot air rises, so colder air must move in to fill the gap caused by the rising air causing a vertical circulation pattern that we feel as wind. A similar flat earther question involves a hypothetical helicopter going straight up and waiting for the earth to rotate beneath it, rather than the helicopter needing to fly west. I want to see, uh, I want to see a helicopter like this uh, lifting off from in Australia upside down while the earth is spinning. I want to see the earth spinning a thousand miles an hour while a helicopter takes off and flies around like you tell us it does. It just seems very absolutely ridiculous to me and uh, you'd have to be really brainwashed to believe something like that, you know, like. Hopefully you can see now why this is impossible. The helicopter is hovering in air that is moving with the earth and the helicopter's momentum prevents it from remaining stationary independent of the Earth's rotation. Number three, why doesn't a plane have to constantly dip its nose to follow the curve of the Earth? 
40,000 feet going horizontal because in my reality, a straight line is a straight line, right? I don't know about other people's realities where a straight line is supposedly curved. But in my reality, the plane gains altitude as it gets further and further away. I mean, not before long. This plane should be in space. The short answer to this is gravity. Planes fly by generating lift with their wings to overcome the force of gravity. When flying level, the force of lift equals the force of gravity on the plane, and therefore the plane stays at a constant altitude. To fly to a higher altitude, that is, up farther away from gravity, you don't just tip the nose up, you also have to apply extra thrust to accelerate and increase the lift. Since the source of gravity is toward the center of the Earth, without extra lift, the plane stays parallel to the curved surface of the Earth, which is measured from mean sea level, disregarding the terrain. So when flying straight and level, gravity keeps the plane in a curved path around the Earth automatically, without any need to dip the nose or to perform any other maneuvers. What pilots call straight and level flight is straight in terms of left and right, but curved vertically with the curve of the Earth. Level means exactly that in this context, parallel to the direction of the force of gravity, which is curved. They do not have to dip the nose to keep the plane level to the surface. Gravity does it automatically for them when they maintain the proper speed and keep the plane pointed straight ahead. Number four. Why did a plane flying from Taiwan to Los Angeles make an emergency landing in Alaska? This claim dates back to 2015, when a pregnant woman went into labor partway through the long flight across the Pacific and actually gave birth before they could land. Flat Earthers claim that the emergency landing in Alaska only makes sense on a flat Earth and not on a globe Earth. Once again, they are flat wrong. Their main error is that they use the wrong kind of map to make their case. A rectangular map of the Earth, such as this, flattens out the Earth's 3D curvature to represent the Earth in a two-dimensional way. When you do this, it will always distort the actual distances and orientations of landmasses on the Earth. The only truly accurate depiction of the Earth is a globe, or a three-dimensional representation of a globe, such as Google Earth. So let's look at the actual intended flight path of this particular flight on Google Earth. Notice how far north the path actually is. The article states that the emergency situation started about six hours into the flight, which puts the plane about here. You can easily see that the nearest populated area to land the plane from that point is indeed Alaska, and it is about 1,900 miles closer than Los Angeles from the point of the emergency. When the intended flight path is depicted on a 2D map, such as a flight tracker map, or the 2D mode of Google Earth, the flight path is curved to account for the Earth's curvature, which has been flattened out in this type of map. Again, this shows that Alaska is a logical emergency landing site for this flight. It is far out of the way, certainly, but less so than any other populated locations. So this flat earth argument doesn't fly. Number five. Why do all intercontinental flights in the Southern Hemisphere make fueling stops in the Northern Hemisphere? I map these out. And look, you know, it just looks ridiculous what you have to try and do. You can't just go straight across. You have to actually get up into the northern hemisphere and then come back down. So that doesn't make any sense. So I mapped it on the flat earth map. And whoa, okay, now it makes sense. This is very similar to the emergency landing claim and has some of the same problems. Notice how they always show the flights on a rectangular projection map, 
rather than using a correct 3D map. But also, they are cherry-picking multi-stop flights when direct flights do exist across the southern continents, like this regularly scheduled flight from Sydney, Australia to Santiago, Chile, Qantas 27. Not only does this flight path make perfect sense on a globe, it is actually impossible on a flat earth. The flight path from FlightAware or any other flight tracker shows that the flight curves down towards Antarctica and back up. Shown on Google Earth, you can clearly see why this works and why it is the most direct path. On a flat earth, the most direct path would take the plane over North America. But that is not what Qantas or any flight tracker show or what anyone has reported. And if you map the actual path on a flat earth, you would actually have to circumnavigate about half the earth. And it would take about three times longer and it would actually be well beyond the maximum distant range of any commercial jetliners. And there are several other direct flights across the Southern Hemisphere continents that flat earthers just ignore or discount, such as from Johannesburg to Perth. But getting back to the supposed Northern Hemisphere fuel stops claimed by flat earthers, this is easily explained. These are not fuel stops, but simply multi-destination routes. It is not economically or feasibly possible for airlines to offer flights from every major city to every other major city, and most especially for very distant cities. So often, long routes are necessarily comprised of multiple shorter routes, even if they have to go far out of the way. For example, I searched for a flight from Sydney, Australia to Santa Cruz, Bolivia. My cheapest results involved three stops in Honolulu, Los Angeles, and Panama. This trip will take a whopping 38 hours and take you thousands of miles out of the way. But this is because there are simply not enough passengers that want to go from Sydney to Bolivia to support a regular direct route. Flat earthers cherry pick cases like this to make their case, and often they assert that the extra stops are fueling stops. No, each leg of the flight will have different passengers, and you will usually have to change planes at each stop, or even change airlines. These are not fuel stops, they are separate flights combined to make long trips economically feasible. And of course, again, they ignore the direct intercontinental flights that do exist in the Southern Hemisphere, like Qantas 27. Some flat earthers even say that that flight is a fake flight. Apparently Qantas, and FlightAware, and Expedia, and all other flight trackers are part of the enormous Globe Earth conspiracy, because reasons. The confirmation bias of some flat earthers knows no bounds. Whatever evidence disagrees with their belief is automatically rejected as fake. That is no way to honestly investigate anything. Number six. How can gyroscopic artificial horizons work if the plane is curving around the earth? Why don't they roll backwards? Now, an aircraft has an artificial horizon and it's based on gyroscope. So before they take off, they, um, they calibrate the um, artificial horizon, they just spin it up um, so that it's level, and, uh, and then they take off. So if, they're, um, if they take off with a gyroscope um, calibrated mm -hmm. and they start going over the curve of the Earth, right. the gyroscope will stay upright. Mm -hmm. So the artificial horizon will start to roll backwards. Right. But it doesn't. It just stays um, nice and flat and level. Mm. Um, that right there is proof that, uh, that you know the planes fly over a plane. In case you don't know, an artificial horizon is an instrument used by pilots to indicate the position of Earth's actual horizon relative to the orientation of the plane. They are especially useful at night or in other low visibility conditions to help the pilot know the plane's attitude. Not to be confused with altitude. Attitude is simply the orientation of the plane with respect to the surface of the Earth and the horizon. If the plane is banked left or right, called roll, or if the nose is pointed up or down, 
called pitch. The artificial horizon will indicate that in an intuitive display. Artificial horizons are also called attitude indicators. It is true that the artificial horizon uses a gyroscope to help it maintain a consistent reference to the real horizon, despite the forces acting on the plane while maneuvering. But flat earthers claim that the artificial horizon gyroscope is fixed in space, and therefore it should roll backwards as the plane flies around the curve of the earth. But this is not true. Once again, they are missing, or intentionally rejecting, one key fact. Artificial horizons have a mechanism which constantly adjusts to the direction of the Earth. This accounts for the fact that gyroscopes always are subject to forces of acceleration, which can cause them to tilt out of alignment, called precession. They tend to be fixed in space, but not with perfect accuracy, so adjustments are needed. And these automatic adjustments will also easily account for the Earth's curvature as well. And they do this using Earth's gravity. Air-driven artificial horizons do this through the use of a mechanism called pendulous vanes that react to the force of gravity to keep the device adjusted to level. Here you can see the inside of a device of this type. Notice how these arms move with gravity when the internal structure is turned. These are the pendulous vanes, and they open or restrict four airflow ports that drive the gyroscope in such a way that it causes it to realign to the Earth's gravity. Electronic versions do this using mercury switches that react to gravity and they control torque motors that adjust the gyroscope. Here is an excellent demonstration of this in a modern electronic artificial horizon by YouTuber Wolfie6020. After intentionally forcing the device out of alignment, you can watch as it automatically adjusts itself back to level over several minutes. Wolfie6020 has a number of excellent videos on the operation of the artificial horizon. I linked some in the description, and he shows them automatically adjusting in both real time and sped up as seen here. The device corrects far faster than is needed to correct for the curvature of the Earth even for the fastest jet aircraft. So once again, flat earthers are ignoring facts that invalidate their claim. All of these questions are based on misunderstandings of how planes work, ignorance of physics, or denial of key facts. When you get all the facts right and understand the physics involved, the globe Earth works perfectly fine and airplanes have no problem flying over and around its surface. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out the other videos in this Flat Earth Falsity series, Debunking Flat Earth Claims, and also my four-part series, Proving the Earth is Not Flat, which demonstrates and explains lots of evidence that you can see for yourself that proves the spherical Earth.